Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Sanctified Mind podcast. I'm joined, as usual, by Daniel. Hey, Ryan. And uh, filling in for both today is my friend uh, Ben, my brother in Christ and uh, elder at our church that we go to. So uh, welcome, guys. Glad to see you both. And how are y'all doing? Thanks doing, for having me. Yeah, doing well. Now, Ben was going to be on anyways, but Bo had to drop out last minute. Uh, his wife's his wife got COVID, so she's in our prayers. Uh, but, you know, at least now we have no Baptists on the show. So we could say that is a market improvement. What do you, what do you think? The More Sanctified Mind podcast, yes. <laughs> Well, we are uh, here today to talk about a book I chose for us to review, uh, and the book that you see here is by Oliver Crisp, uh, who is a professor of systematic theology at Fuller Seminary. The book is called Deviant Calvinism, and its stated purpose is to broaden recognition of what beliefs we are allowed to hold within Reformed tradition. Uh, As Crisp argues, the Reformed tradition comprises a variegated and diverse body of theological views, even on matters once thought to be definitive of those churches bearing its name. And in the course of the book, he talks about a few different subjects, uh, including eternal justification, libertarian Calvinism, universalism, and hypothetical universal atonement. Crisp thinks that these are intrinsically interesting subjects for uh, theological exploration. So to open up the review, my question to both of you is whether you agree with him about that. Uh, Did you enjoy the book? And did you agree with the author's thesis about whether Reformed theology has a broader tradition than some may have supposed. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of questions you just asked, but in general, did I enjoy the book? Not really. Um, do I agree with the, th- the thesis that Reformed theology is broader than maybe currently supposed, I guess, in most Reformed circles? No. I, again, I disagree with that, um, at least in the way that he, he put it forth as— these are also within the bounds of Calvinism or reform. That, that was kind of confusing to me. Like, you know, are we talking about what is, what is Calvinism or what is, you know, if it's deviant Calvinism, like who confesses to Calvinism, you know, and, and what, what is the bounds of Calvinism? So that was kind of confusing. You kind of use that interchangeably. It seemed like with like confessionalism and reformed. And I don't think those are the same thing. Um, so maybe you could argue that within the scope of Calvinist type doctrines, you know, I mean, is a four point Calvinist, a Calvinist, you know, is, is a three point Calvinist. So, uh, but I, I, the book was, I, it wasn't bad. I mean, it made you think, so that was good. It was very wordy. I felt like in a lot of ways, um, and a lot of stuff to me was just unnecessary because I subscribe to the Westminster confession of faith. And that's kind of the point of it. Like it fences out, it fences the conversation. And I, I feel like these things felt outside the fence. So, I don't really have any great desire to read or know about those things. Although in a sense, those are good things to know about if you're dealing with people who are, you know, putting those things forward and believing those things. So, yeah, I'd have to say anytime that a book concludes by uh, encouraging the reformed tradition to be softer in its stance on uh, certain doctrines like the atonement, um, I'm probably going to have a challenge with it. Um, But that said, I did appreciate Crisp's uh, honesty about where he was coming from. Um, I think a book like this, at least for me, it helps kind of keep me sharp on some of the important issues of Scripture and help me uh, uh, remember, you know, where uh, we're coming from within Scripture on doctrine like the atonement, election, the order of salvation. Um, And so Crisp helped me uh, to do that, even though I I disagreed certainly with his conclusions and some of his arguments pretty extensively. Uh, It was still a helpful book to see where uh, this line of thought is uh, going within some of what we might consider more liberal seminaries and certainly liberal denominations within uh, that take on the broader title of evangelical. 
Right, because there's one thing we know about liberalism is it doesn't stay in its own circles, right? It always wants to invade the conservative circles. It always wants to progress, right? Progressivism is about progressing, is changing, um, and it always wants to come for the, the conservative. And, you know, no denomination is um, too conservative and immune to liberal, you know, creepings. So, Yeah, I guess in the end I would have to agree with both of you. Um, I chose this book because— a lot of the subjects in it at the time when I had first saw it, I don't remember exactly when it came out, um, sometime in the teens, but there were issues that I was wrestling with, uh, you know, trying to sift through, understand the theological arguments for or against. And I think that there is a purpose for this book, but it has the wrong context for it. So the, the context for this book, as stated, is to broaden the reform tradition. I think a better stated purpose would have been for theological clarification which is something that Chris mentions in the book and is worthwhile. It's good to have a clear understanding of what things are, you know, what doctrines are being put forward so that you can um, either come to agree with it or disagree with it for good reasons. But um, I just wish especially that he would have, um, you know, given that this is a book about reform theology brought scripture more into the picture in one of the early chapters of the book's, uh, he, he talks about how scripture is our norming norm. It's the standard by which all other subservient authorities are to be measured. But then throughout the rest of the book, there were not too many references to scripture. And um, when I see words like, I want to give reformed theologians wiggle room to have this or that belief, uh, it just seems like he was emphasizing ecumenism over truth. And we should always be guided by the truth of God's word and see, you know, search for that knowledge and Ben, I think you actually had a count on the number of distinct. Yeah, I, I'd have to go through and double check if it was accurate, but I, there were about 14 distinct in, uh, scripture references through the book, uh, maybe about 27 in total, but a lot of them were the same scripture reference, and none of them were written out. Right, and for a book that's about Reformed theology, and Reformed theology is always about reforming towards what scripture would have us believe to include all of these different doctrines and then almost dismissively say that oh well, the bible might have say you know have so, something to say about this but uh we're not going to get into that here doesn't seem like it fits within the context of what he was trying to do which is broaden reform theology and if you're going to do that you do have to account for how that fits with scripture yeah i will defend him at that point just a little bit um just because if the idea of the book was just to try to broaden the idea of what calvinism or reform theology is then I could see, you know, for the sake of, a, you know, brevity or something and, you know, containing the arguments and not getting too deep into the weeds. If that's all he's trying to do is show that this falls within the confessions, the different reformed confessions, like this is allowable inside of those, then I could understand not using scripture um, because just because he doesn't use scripture doesn't mean scripture doesn't back up his positions necessarily, right? Uh, but I do think that it would have been a big bolster to his arguments if he's not just purely arguing like on a philosophical or, you know, um, logical, like this is this because this, you know, and this is why this is okay. I think it definitely would have bolstered his argument if he could show that he is concerned about what scripture says, right? It, just that he does have a concern and he's not purely try, concerned with, um, you know, some kind of tradition or, you know, the confession. So, Right. Um, and that is valid. Uh, it is good to have those things, but... Um, one of the things that stuck out to me at some point was the way he, and this is on page 136, if either of you have the book in front of you, um, <clears throat> in reference to something like universalism, which he does try to promote a defense for, not that he necessarily subscribes to it, but um, in that context, he mentions that he's uh, not happy with an option that an Augustinian might have because it seems that there's no good philosophical reason for it apart from the argument of scripture. And then, you know, it's almost to me at that point, like he's saying, I'm unhappy if only scripture speaks to this subject. If there's nothing philosophical to back it up, you know, I'm not, that's not good with me or uh, there has to be something supplemental to that. And again, if scripture is your ultimate rule of faith and authority, that should be sufficient. You should take that and be happy with it. Um, so recommendations for the book, other uh, thoughts on it? Well, we could talk a little bit about the different things he covers. I mean, he covers justification from or in eternity, hypothetical universalism, 
uh, the double payment. I mean, the most of the book I think was taken up with the justification from eternity or the, some form of universalism in different, different things. Um, he tries to fit those within the bounds of the confession. I, I disagree. <laughs> I would say, I think that, you know, some critiques and there's some good reviews out online, uh, on the book and some of the authors were critiquing him for his lack of interacting with historical or his knowledge of history or trying to gain supporters for his position that really didn't support his position. And one, the one thing that I read uh, that really stuck out to me was that he can bring, you know, all these different kind of deviant views that he, he would say, there's no one who held all of them. I mean, they were, they were always one offs. Like one guy said, you know, held this here. One guy held this here. You know, the church obviously rejected all these things and the vast majority of notable authors, pastors, teachers, you know, from church history rejected these things as well. So they were, um, novelties when he did find them, you know, there's no one who held all these in any, any kind of systematic doctrine. And I also think him, you know, his arguments for trying to locate them inside of the confession, especially the Westminster confession are weak. I think other parts of the confession than what he quoted, like rule that out, you know, I mean, for, for instance, the, he talks about justification, uh, from it or just the universal, like hypothetical universalism and the confession says, you know, that, uh, God gives the, you know, he decreed who was going to be saved and then Christ actually died for them. And, you know, he's going to get all the ones that were given to him. And it's like, where's the, where's the hypothetical, where's, you know, where's the room for that in the confession? So I don't think it does fall within the bounds of the confession. I would say that's true. Um, and sometimes when he quotes part of the confession, he doesn't quote other parts. So in a chapter on libertarian Calvinism, he might quote the whole chapter from, you know, section three of the Westminster confession, but if you would just go back some, you know, one chapter before that and see that God alone is unto himself all sufficient, not standing in any need of creatures with which he hath made. You have to take that into the context of the confession as well. And then think to yourself, well, if I have libertarian free will, does that mean that God depends on me or not? And it does mean that. So what the confession is doing there is excluding it. You just wouldn't necessarily get that from reading what stated in the book itself. Or I, I like how you put out, you know, mentioned Daniel that they're one offs. I think in one chapter um, on universalism, maybe uh, he mentioned somebody that could hypothetically maybe have held to it in the 1800s as a hopeful universalist, but he didn't push it too far. Some Sometimes I thought that this was less about what has been within the tradition and more of his wish as to what could be within the tradition from a conceptual understanding. And those are clearly different things. You know, there's, there's historical theology, which I thought that this book was going to be about. And then, um, as you said, he's more so engaging with contemporary philosophers and there's a time and place for that. Um, uh, but if you're trying to broaden the reform tradition and give it its bearings or let people know that there's more to it than that, I, I thought that there was going to be more meat to the book as far as historical theology was concerned. Yeah, Ryan, I think you uh, hit the nail on the head when you said a few minutes ago that there is a strong ecumenical aspect to this book. I think uh, for me, the thesis was largely that even in his introduction, there's a couple times even uh, within the footnotes, but within the, the uh, language itself, page 15 being one of them, where he makes uh, it very clear that his view is that the Reformed and Roman Catholics are in the same religion. Uh, I think he even makes the reference siblings can have periods in which their relationship is strained and difficult, but he makes it absolutely clear that Roman Catholicism and Reformed are part of the same. And I think that comes out throughout. He makes a lot of reference to, even within um, uh, different, different topics, within different chapters, the idea of post-mortem justification. You know, and you see some of this Roman theology coming in, uh, and then, of course, the goal within ecumenicity, especially when it's promoting a Roman Catholic ecumenicity with the Reformed, is universally to get the Reformed to soften their position to Rome. And I think that was an underlying, it wasn't, he didn't bring it out strongly after the introduction, but it was an underlying theme that I saw throughout. You know, you said that, and I completely had forgotten about it by the time I finished the book. And now I remember that at the time he said that, you know, you can somewhat try to if you want to try to see it from his perspective, Protestantism and Roman Catholicism sort of came up in a similar sphere of Western civilization. Um, but if you're going to say that they're brother and sister, I think that what you need to rather do is again, go back to the word of God and that we are adopted by the father. You know, you have to look at what your fellow adopted siblings are believing here. And this, that goes to what the church's 
um, who are true believing churches, say those, you know, confessional churches, um, who have put their foot down and said that, you know, this is what the gospel is. There's no compromise and it's not about ecumenism. Ultimately, it should be about what the truth is and knowing the truth is, um, ultimately what's important that comes from God's word, not from the traditions of men. Yeah. And it's pretty hilarious if you think about it, because what the, what was the reformation? It was a coming away from the Roman Catholic church. Uh, the reformers had nothing good to say about the Roman Catholic church. I mean, if they, if they were divided on things, it wasn't in their condemnation of the Roman Catholic church. Right. So the idea that we should soften and go back to the, you know, the Roman Catholic church as being part of a reformed tradition is just nonsensical. Um, you know, the, and we'll talk, maybe talk about this in the next episode, but the the idea of always reforming, that was in the context of always reforming away from the Roman Catholic Church, right? It wasn't in the idea of re- always reforming, we need to write a new confession every five years. It was, the backdrop of that was reforming away from the Catholic Church. Like, that was their concern, reforming away from the Catholic Church. Or, and, or reforming it to the Word of God. Right, or reforming the Catholic Church to the Word of God, right. Um so, yeah, the idea that we need to soften, you know, and kind of accept or, or that we're the same religion is totally antithetical to the, the reformers. So for sure. I also didn't like how it seemed he would to try to say someone was within the bounds of the confession, you know, confessional or, or the reformed world or the reformed stream. He would just argue like for Arminius, he was like, well, he existed in the time of the Reformation and they didn't condemn him right away, so therefore he is within the the bounds of reformed thought. It's like, you know, it's like what? Like that's like a historical, that's like a you know, uh, an error of like category. Um, they didn't have internet, right? They weren't, you know, <laughs> not the whole reformed world was was aware of his heresy two days later. I mean, you know, so the, just the idea that because someone lived during that time period and they taught something um, means they were part of the reformed tradition. And I think kind of. Uh, it just ignores the idea of what the church has accepted. It also ignores the canons of Dort where he's like explicitly condemned. Right. Um, but it just uh, ignores this idea of um, the church receiving teachings, the, you know, the church confessing teachings. And obviously the reformed church does not confess that. So how is it part of the restore, you know, reform stream? So. Well, we spoke about that a little bit on the last episode of the idea of instant gratification versus having a long-term view of church history. You have to allow time for things, things to unfold in God's time. You know, what, um, may have happened a long time ago when Athanasius stood against everybody. Well, yeah, it was just Athanasius, but over time you see that the church agrees with him about the Trinity. Uh, you can't just like Daniel said, say, Oh, he lived in the time and wasn't condemned by any of his contemporaries who may not have even known about him, uh, or may have, and just been trying to correct him at the time behind closed doors or whatnot. Um, yeah. I mean, there's lots more we could say on this book, uh, but I don't think we want to get too much in the weeds. I, I, you know, I don't recommend the book unless, you know, you're confronted with this error and you kind of want to see how they argue um, so that you could refute the errors. Uh, but, I mean, the normal Christian doesn't need, you know, to me, this book uh, shows us the importance of the confessions, right? If anything, if at the end he would have been like, and this book was just written to show you how important confessions are so that you don't have to go outside the bounds of the confession. Because if you're fenced in by the bounds of the confession, you don't have to worry about these kind of deviant uh, views, I would call them. Um, so that's my takeaway from the book is, you know, just shows the importance of confessions and I would not recommend it to the vast majority of people. Yeah. I think I would have to uh, agree similarly that there's, uh, just from what I've seen in my lifetime and in, in dealing with and working with Christians who have been struggling with different issues, especially those that are coming and looking like CRISP is really looking to a philosophical approach to these types of things where the scripture is on par with other arguments. Um, it can come across very depressing. Uh, if I was thinking about this without the authority of Scripture, this would be a very depressing book. What did God do in the atonement? What did Christ do for me? And I didn't come away from this book with an answer. Um, and so if, if the Scripture is not the root of an individual's faith, this, this book needs to be way down in the pile. Um, but in terms of keeping someone sharp in knowing what times, what types of arguments are out there in main mainline seminaries on, you know, in the U S and I think also in, in, uh, the UK where, uh, crisp also teaches, um, it's helpful to see what's going on, what kind of thought is out there and just how much the scripture has taken a, a secondary or even maybe a third place in the line of argument. Yep. I would agree. Uh, as somebody who 
went through the gamut of Christian philosophy um, in my early 20s and had to take a long time before I found that you're not going to be satisfied unless God's word is your foundation for your life. Uh, I would not recommend this book except for those of you who already have an understanding about, um, you know, God's sovereignty, redemption, justification, atonement, uh, condemnation, all these different issues that come from God's word. And then, and only then still look at this view through the lens of ways in which to get a better conceptual understanding of those arguments that are out there for theological clarification. Um, I wouldn't recommend it as something that is a good goal to have for trying to broaden the reform tradition. Again, we should always go back to God's word, um, to know truth. So I think that will wrap up this portion of our episode and we'll come back and discuss some of the related themes in the book in our next one. So we'll see you then. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Ben. We're actually going to play Bo's audio. So Bo, okay. Bo sent me some, some, Bo sent me some thoughts on the book. So we're going to play that now. So you can stick around and listen to his uh, two minute blurb about the book as well. So thanks. So I'm not going to be very long winded, but since I put in the effort of finishing this book, I want to say my piece about it. This book is written admittedly from the author as an exercise in speculative theology. The author is dealing in these matters from a logical and philosophical perspective, which is essentially devoid of scripture except for a few parts. His stated objective is to show that the label confessional is more broad than what's interpreted. He decided to write a whole book exploring these different views, Calvinistic libertarianism, hypothetical universalism, Augustinian universalism, and several other isms. It got difficult to keep up with him by the end of the book. The constant introduction of all these minority positions, which minority positions have always been allowed in Reformed theology. See Jonathan Edwards' ideas about recreation for an example. The constant introduction of all these minority positions can be overwhelming. Suffice to say, it's been historically understood that there are areas of secondary importance which Reformed tradition has always allowed for. I think we have to be open-minded that people can arrive at Orthodox thought in various ways. It seems to me that the framers of the Reformed confessions understood this. What the author often tries to do, in my view, is utilize overly philosophical language in order to establish a position as within the Reformed tradition. What he fails to do is establish that these positions can be derived either explicitly from Scripture or by good and necessary consequence, which is the basis for the Reformed hermeneutic. If a view cannot be done on those grounds, it ought not be accepted regardless of philosophical or logical explanation. The author was very weak on that point, and for that reason, I think he failed to live up to his stated purpose. It seems to me that confessionalism is a guard which stands at the door of the speculative theology which the author undertook in this extremely wordy book. I believe we should remain within confessional boundaries on issues unless we are convinced by Scripture that the confession is wrong. The confession is always subordinate to the teaching of Scripture. It literally states that in the first chapter. Because this book fails at its stated purpose due to lack of exegesis to establish these positions as within the bounds of the confession, I don't recommend it. Just read the Reformed Confessions instead.